resources has evolved rapidly over the years. Our occupation expanded from being the personnel department or paperwork manager to now being the strategic business partner. Each one of us who works in HR has different experiences based on the type of industry or employer we work for or the type of role that we play. To give exposure to different employers and HR practitioners and to engage our members with diversified learning needs, I'm very excited to show you these interactive dialogues between myself and other HR practitioners in the vlog format. Hmm, can't wait. Let's watch the video. <laughs> Hello, everyone. Welcome to HR Explores Alberta's Workplaces. My name is Ada. I am the host and the initiator of this program. Along with me is Kiana Prasma. Kiana is the Human Resources Manager for Horse Lake First Nation Community. Hello, Kiana. Welcome. Hello, Ada. Thank you for having me. Excellent. Uh, when you first approached me and expressed interest in this uh, vlog opportunity, I was super excited because for as an HR professional, there are tons of learnings for us to gain uh, further insight into how to manage human resources of a First, First Nation community. So please tell us a bit more about your organization. So Horse Lake First Nation is located near Hythe, Alberta. It's a part of a party of Treaty 8 and a, mes a member of Western Cree Tribal Council. Uh, the band actually has two reserves with a total land mass of uh, 3,099 hectares. So just under 31 square kilometers. Um, Horse Lake First Nation is, uh, or sorry, has for-profit entities as well. Um, those are Horse Lake Oilfield Construction Corporation, which is a civil contractor of over 10 years of experience working in the resources industry. Uh, they offer um, services such as heavy civil, right-of-way clearing, and project management. Um, Horse Lake uh, First Nations also has what's called the Industry Relations Corp, which is a consultation office uh, with industry and government in relation to the proposed activities and projects that happen on Treaty 8 territory. Uh, the IRC works closely with elders, knowledge holders, land users, and environmental monitors in relation to assessing the dispositions and large industrial project proposed in the Treaty 8 territory. That's amazing. Mm -hmm. It sounds like you have a busy portfolio, even though you work for the uh, uh, First Nation community, actually you're supporting a few organizations within that community. How do you manage your day-to-day -day work? <laughs> <laughs> I find myself like I'm very much, I, I have to use my Outlook calendar like crazy or else I won't get anything done. Um, I also use sticky notes and they're all over my office. Um, but I, I'm pretty flexible. Like, I mean, we've got offices that uh, not all of our offices are in the same location. So I do have to be flexible on that end in order to uh, travel place to place. Um, but yeah, like I just need to schedule myself and use my Outlook calendar or else I won't get very far. <laughs> And uh, so I also understand the Horse Lake First Nation community shut down uh, during the COVID-19 period and got reopened um, June 30th, 2020. So please tell the audience a bit more about your COVID-19 experience and uh, what control measures did uh, the community put into place to protect the members' well-being. Yeah, so back in March when the government advised of the closures, uh, the Chief and Council of Horse Lake uh, actually took it one step further and they put security measures in place. So what that consisted of was um, the cement barricades everyone sees. We put those across our access points um, to and from the reserve. Uh, with that, we employed our members of the First Nations community to uh, ensure that uh, the conditions of the security was being met. Um, so we worked closely with Alberta Health Services during that time. They had a questionnaire, um, actually a lot of organizations use, just quite simple, um, just to make sure the same questions being asked, have you traveled out of country in the last 14 days, been in contact with anybody who's had the COVID symptoms, that sort of thing. Um, in June, when the latest phase happened, we, we kept our security measures in place for a little bit there, but then we removed them back uh, June 30th. Um, but with all of the closures, because we limited access to and from the community, we had to bring the resources to our community. So myself with a, a couple other of our employees actually um, managed bringing out bulk groceries. So what we did was we put food hampers per household uh, together. So your non-perishables, your baking goods, 
um, that sort of thing. So your flours, your oils, your sugars, your milk, um, some vegetables, your starches, that sort of thing, uh, were actually brought to our community instead of our community members leaving and going and getting it all. That just speaks to the scope of us working in HR, right? Our job is so different based on industry and organization that you work at. That's really neat to hear about that experience firsthand. COVID-19 has caused stress to a lot of organizations and individuals, working professionals. Will the community operate the same prior, uh, after the pandemic or will there will be major changes? Um, I think just like in everybody's retrospect of all the organizations that I've even talked to, I think there's going to be minor changes for sure. Um, I mean, like everyone's hygiene increased during this time, which is never a bad thing. Um, but as of June 15th, we actually reopened our offices with limitations. Uh, so right now, um, only the managers of the departments are back in office full time. Um, other employees are in and out on an employment or an appointment only basis. Um, one of our biggest changes is that we're having, so we do have a fully functional daycare, um, ages seven months to six years old out here as well. Right now it is only open to um, people that have returned to work, so it's not open to all community members. Uh, with that you have to fill out uh, a lot of paperwork. Um, I, I use a daycare for myself, <laughs> for my babies, and uh, yeah, so they, they fill out quite a bit of paperwork um, that is governed by Alberta Health Services, which is really good. It's just to make sure that the health and safety of the children that are there and the staff that are there, um, those measures are being met, um, but I don't foresee that changing anytime soon. I think those regulations and those increased measures will stay in place for quite some time. Kiana, based on our conversation when we spoke over the phone just last week, I understand that uh, with the uh, Horse Lake First Nation community, the community is actually growing really fast. And over the year that you have been working there, you've seen a fast growing number of skilled tradespeople or professionals getting their solid education and develop different skill sets and experiences. So tell us a bit more about uh, the environment there. Yeah, so um, I mean, like I'm new to this First Nations itself. I didn't grow up around here or anything, so it's just all a learning curve. Um, but within the community and like whom are on your payroll and employed, we've got various skilled tradesmen um, working on many projects within the nations. So we've a range from gas fitters, plumbers, um, and carpenters um, with it within the community here. Uh, we do promote um, education. It, it is very high priority for the community. So we do actually have quite a few apprentices working under those journeymen as well to maintain their journeyman status. Um, on the other end of that, like our for-profit entities carry different skills, uh, trades such as heavy duty equipment operators and mechanics. Um, the nation has a great post-secondary program, which helps guide the students towards post-secondary diplomas, graduate degrees, uh, trades programs, and the master programs. Um, so it, it just depends on the enrollment per year um, and what, what program you are entering uh, during that time period. Um, but they really, really promote uh, post-secondary education, whether it's the trades programs or other diplomas. That's great to hear. And also based on our conversation last week, you also mentioned to me that uh, the First Nation community is also developing a few for-profit entities. So tell us a bit more about those organizations. Yeah, so our uh, for-profit entities I, I mentioned above there, um, but the geographical area that we're situated in is oil and gas dominated. Uh, so our poor for-profit entities that operate um, are the Industry Relations Corp, which is the Environmental Monitoring as mentioned, and uh, the Oil Field Construction Corp as well. So the IRC office is a consult consultation office within industry and uh, government in relation to the proposed activities and projects that happen in Treaty 8. Um, the IRC works closely with elders, knowledge holders, land users, and environmental monitors in relation to assessing the dispositions and large industrial projects proposed in the Treaty 8 territory. Um, HOCC, which we call HOC, is the Oilfield Construction Corp. Uh, they are a civil contractor with over 10 years of experience working in the resources field. Uh, they offer services such as heavy civil, right-of-way clearing, and project management. Um, each organization of the for-profit entities employs First Nations members and promotes training and career development. Um, they both have a very diverse yet skilled workforce um, within, within their employee base. So working as an HR person, especially as an HR person, as a non-First Nation person yourself, 
how does that work? That must be an interesting, exciting, and yet challenging experience. So tell the audience a bit more about your experience there. Yeah, so it's, it's really awesome so far. I, I actually started last year and I was nine months pregnant, so that was a little interesting. Um, I was grateful enough to land the opportunity to work here, bring my baby to work, and not be shunned or frowned upon it. Um, once I made the connection with the staff members, uh, they'd actually just come to my office, acknowledge my baby, and take him for a few minutes and walk around the office, which was really nice. Um, since then, uh, since we've all returned to work uh, from with the COVID measures, uh, he's actually been in our daycare, which he absolutely loves. Um, the, the girls are awesome there. Uh, over the uh, past year, um, we've made every effort to standardize and streamline the HR process of the nation and within its entities. So a lot of paperwork was completed on my end, but that's our job. <laughs> um, we, we are there, but we still have room for improvement. Um, like as always, there's always room for improvement in every organization. We utilize our social media platforms for recruitment needs within the nation, and it seems to work well with uh, gathering a larger applicant pool. Um, we also increased our advertising efforts. So what I mean by that is we're trying to change the stereotype of the First Nations communities by showcasing what we have done within the community. A uh, few examples of that is the water treatment plant. Uh, it was a new addition of, um, as well as a new addition of the Horse Lake First Nations Fire Hall um, and its for-profit sectors. So back in 2018, Horse Lake completed the water treatment plant which we do like to showcase as a large part of the community, yeah, bringing fresh drinking water and clean drinking water to the community. Um, also, the new addition of the fire hall allows more space for the fire chief and its volunteers, um, as we're in a rural community. So it is maintained by the county of Grand Prairie, but we work in correlation with them um, and respond to, respond to the emergencies actually within the county as needed. Um, the IRC and Hawk are advertised in the same sense where these services are provided in the available region uh, as a selling feature. It is First Nations owned and operated. That's an amazing story. I'm just learning lots and really got engaged into your uh, uh, into your experience there because it's so different from what I experience and from a lot of us who work in, in corporations as an HR person experience. Um, as an HR, I have to ask you, how does the compensation work there? Like, how is the compensation structure and the grid, all of that is set up? Yeah, so our compensation model is a little bit different than most, uh, what most would know. Our for-profit sectors, like the rest of the revenue generators, they follow the market, the labor pool, and the prices within the industry. Um, but with the band operated positions, we do have governing bodies in respect to compensation guidelines. Uh, for example, because we're a member of Western Creek Tribal Council, which is a governing council for three nations, um, their primary purpose is to assist the members and to act on behalf of member First Nations at the request of and under the direction of the First Nations. So what that means is they have set compensation standards based off of the funding that they receive um, to the respective nations. So what that means is, is if there is a um, new opportunity that arises, say within our health center, it, it does have a compensation structure outlined by the funding that they received and for the period of time. So some programs are a year, some programs are five years, and that, it, that guideline includes the wages, the compensation, and the materials needed for that program. Um, another example that we have is that funding that we've received through Indigenous Service Canada, it's also known as ISC to a lot of people. Um, it allows us to generate compensation based off of the funds that they provide as well. So in retrospect, the compensation depends on the position, the length of the role, and the funding attached to the program or role. Um, on my end, I track the historical data changes in our payroll system per role, per grant funding, and the reviews of it all. And you still have some flexibility and autonomy to make changes as you see fit. Okay. Yes, do you, you also go by an annual, let's say, merit increase process or performance uh, bonus? Structure? Yes, we do. So normally what we do is after your probationary period, we do an initial review um, just to make sure that the employee and the employer, you know, they're on the same gauge and in alignment. Um, with that, we, after that, we do annuals. Um, we usually have a merit uh, per program um, increase that we follow. But again, though, like it depends on the, the structure of the program, what it entails and what that person is taking on through that role. Um, there's, there's a couple people who have taken on um, different roles within their role, so then obviously compensation does change if those guidelines. Right, perfect. Thank you, Kiana. You have shared lots of amazing experience and lots of amazing stories for, for us working in HR or just business management in general to gain insight of. Um, 
as we're winding down our conversation here, do you have anything else that you would like to share with the audience? I don't think so at this time. It's just to highlight like Horse Lake uh, being the rural community itself. It's for-profit entities as well. Um, it's just a great experience like highlighting these sectors of the province because I don't think there's much light shined on them. <laughs> That's right. I agree. And I hope this vlog, uh, once it's published, will showcase to our audience that uh, their First Nation community actually has a lot to offer. And mm -hmm. if you're curious, our audience want to find out the contact information of Kiana, or the uh, First Nation community, they're posted on our, at the end of our video. Okay, thank you very much for your time today, Kiana. It's nice meeting you. Thank you as well.